Uh, my name is Alec Opata. I'm the Associate Student Manager of the Rose Institute of State and Local Government. The War on Marijuana has a long and controversial history dating back to the beginning of anti-weed sentiment as a reaction to increased use among Mexican immigrants in the 1930s, culminating in federal criminalization of the drug in the Controlled Substances Act of 1970. In recent years, marijuana possession has become a part of the mass incarceration problem our country is facing. While pot use is similar between white people and black people, black people are four times more likely to be arrested for marijuana possession, and states spend over $3.5 billion every year enforcing these laws. Reacting to these issues, states have started to blaze a new trail on weed policy. Nine states have now legalized recreational use of marijuana, while 31 states allow marijuana use for medical purposes. California rec rec recently legalized recreational marijuana through Proposition 64. Our speaker today, Tony Macia, will talk to us about the lessons that can be learned from Colorado, one of the first states to legalize recre recreational marijuana and the highest state in the union by elevation, of course. Tony Macia is a senior writer at the Weekly Standard. Previously, he spent more than a decade as a business reporter and editor at the Charlotte Observer in North Carolina. He's a graduate of Duke University and has a master's in journalism from the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Mr. Macia will be the first speaker in a series on the public policy implications of marijuana legalization sponsored by the Rose Institute of State and Local Government. As always, audio and visual recording is strictly prohibited. Please silence and put away your cell phones and join me in welcoming Mr. Macia to the Athenaeum. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, everybody coming out this afternoon. Um, uh, it's great to be back in California. I'm a native of the Bay Area. Uh, spent the last, uh, I hear it's here. I uh, spent the last 25 years uh, or so uh, living on the East Coast, but it's good to be back here. And went for a run this morning, smell the eucalyptus leaves that reminded me of my childhood. But I know you're here today not to talk about eucalyptus leaves, but to hear about a different kind of leaf. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit about marijuana legalization. Um, I had written a piece a few months ago uh, for the Weekly Standard uh, about marijuana legalization. Uh, I mean, marijuana is a very, uh, you know, very big topic. I brought some samples for people today, samples of the article, I don't, <laughs> not of actual marijuana. And I've got some up, up front if you want to grab one of those. Um, you know, uh, research indicates that about 20% of uh, U.S. adults are regular uh, current users of marijuana, and uh, I see there are about 100 people in the room here, so I guess we can kind of do the math on that. Uh, anybody impaired uh, right, right now? I'd make the talk a lot more interesting, probably. But um, <clears throat> anyway, well, what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the article um, uh, that I wrote. I'm going to talk about sort of the, the, the genesis of it. I'm going to talk about some of the people I met out in Colorado, and uh, I'm going to sort of leave you with a few bigger questions at the end, and then, of course, I'll leave time for questions uh, at the end of the talk. Um, you know, all joking aside, you know, it is, it is a serious issue. It's an interesting issue. Uh, you have a, about a dozen states that have moved forward with recreational marijuana legalization, and, and many more that, uh, you know, have, have legalized for medicinal reasons. Um, you know, you have Canada that's looking, I think, later this year at legalizing for recreational marijuana. And I think just in the popular culture, it's sort of viewed at least the news coverage I see, it's sort of viewed as something that's um, kind of neat and, and cool, and um, that, you know, that might very well be the case, but I think you know, from a public uh, policy standpoint, I think there are a lot of open questions, and I think there's, a, there's some serious questions about how do you regulate this new industry that's popping up. Uh, a lot of the legalization I think that you've seen in a lot of these states uh, it really is coming about because of a big shift in, in public opinion. Um, you know, 20, 30 years ago, uh, the push for marijuana legalization was really just a small handful of activists. It seems sort of like a pipe dream that that, um, that that would ever happen. And fast forward to today, you have all kinds of states legalizing it. You know, we're in the middle of a, um, you know, uh, in Washington, a debate over, uh, you know, uh, Judge Kavanaugh and is he qualified? Is, has he done things that are disqualifying to be put on the Supreme Court? You know, 30 years ago for this exact same seat, the Kennedy seat, uh, one of the people who was nominated before Anthony Kennedy, Douglas Ginsburg, one of the reasons he, or the reason he, he withdrew from being um, 
uh, through the nomination for, uh, to the Supreme Court was because of past marijuana use in the, his college years and, uh, and uh, a little bit later on beyond that. I mean, it's almost inconceivable to think of nowadays that that would be an issue, um, you know, given the, the massive shift in, in public opinion when about two-thirds of, of U.S. adults now believe that um, marijuana should be legalized. So um, the piece that I wrote for the Weekly Standard was looking at Colorado. And the reason that we chose to go out to Colorado and do a piece on Colorado was because, uh, as you mentioned, the, it's really the first state to legalize recreationally. Uh, in 2014 in Colorado, um, uh, they began selling uh, marijuana in the dispensaries legally. It was the first state. Um, for that to happen. And so the thinking was, well, let's go out there and talk and do actual journalism and talk to people and see what the effect of that has been since they've been at it longer than anybody else. And it's a pressing question, you know, here in California, a lot of other states that are trying to, trying to deal with this regulatory question. So what I did was really more, I guess, you know, in academia you would call it more sort of a qualitative study. I went out, I talked to a lot of people, uh, I, I used some of the available data that was out there. There's not a whole lot but looked at some of the available data um, that researchers at different universities had, had done, went to a dispensary, um, you know, went to a big grow operation, you know, talked to people in both of those places, talked to activists on both sides, talked to mothers who worried about the effect on their children, talked to doctors, to police, to advocates for the homeless, tried to just look and answer the question, you know, what can Colorado teach us uh, about marijuana legalization? What can they teach the rest of the country about marijuana um, legalization? Um, and so, again, sort of overlaid a lot of those interviews with some data. There was a really good report um, that, that came out from uh, Colorado State University. The place that I looked was in, in the town of, where I did most of the research was in the town of uh, Pueblo. It's an industrial town, about 100,000 people, two hours south of Denver. Um, and I, I picked that because it was, I thought, a sort of interesting place in the sense that their, their political leadership was very much interested in attracting uh, marijuana, uh, marijuana grows and marijuana businesses. They saw it as a way of revitalizing the, um, their community. And so I figured, okay, this will be a good place to kind of look at, you know, what are the pros, what are the cons? And then I also spent, um, so I spent several days in Pueblo. Uh, you know, looking, uh, looking into that. Also, it was right around 4.20, by the way, so you can imagine it was a pretty interesting time to be out there at the dispensaries, going into the dispensaries, uh, you know, a day before 4.20, it was just pandemonium, line out the door, people getting their, the supplies that they needed to, to celebrate 4.20. Um, and it's sort of funny, you know, I talked to my kids, and I would tell, I told them, oh, I'm going out to Colorado to do, um, uh, you know, to do a piece on marijuana, and they said, oh, yeah, sure, Dad, you're going to do some research out there. I'll bet you are. And that's sort of the, the joke that I would hear a lot of. But, you know, but really the piece that I wrote that I wound up writing for the Weekly Standard, um, it, it's, you know, it wasn't, you know, some polemical article. It wasn't, it wasn't trying to take sides. Uh, I'm not really an advocate on either side or the other. The, the idea was let's go find the facts. Let's stick to the facts and sort of let people decide. Um, you know, it's, it's not really a, any sort of a, a partisan exercise. I, kn I know some of the speakers in this series, you know, you have from coming from different points of view, which is great. And I, I think the wonderful thing about being in a community like this is you can, you can hear both sides of an issue, you can hear the facts, and, and make, up, um, make up your own minds. My, I mean, my, I don't really have a very strong view um, on whether it's good or whether it's bad. I think the, the more reasonable approach is there are pluses and there are minuses. I think um, as you get older, I think you sort of learn things aren't necessarily just black and white, positive or negative. I think there it becomes a little more nuanced. There are some advantages to it, I think, but there are also some drawbacks. And so I think some of that was borne out in the reporting. So I just want to tell you a little bit about um, you know, some of the people I met out there, some of the things I learned. Um, one of the first places I went, and it's sort of funny, uh, the, the idea of, of me speaking to college students about marijuana instead of the other way around, but that's, that's, the, that's, the, world, uh, that's the, the world we're in. Um, but the first, one of the first places I went was a dispensary um, in Pueblo called the 404. Um, hung out for a few hours with a bud tender there. The bud tenders are the people who are, you know, well, I'm telling you this, you know, the distributing the, um, you know, distribute the, the marijuana, make recommendations, much like a bartender, you know, you come in like a bartender might 
Um, you might have a particular brand, you know, a particular type of whiskey you like. The bud tenders, they know what, what kind of, they can recommend what kind of uh, cannabis you might like. Um, at this one dispensary, there are 40 different kinds, 40 different strains of, of marijuana. Um, and what was really eye-opening to me is really how many different types of cannabis products there are. I mean, for people my age, I'm in my mid-40s, um, you know, the conception of marijuana from movies or high school or wherever is, you know, people just smoking a, a joint, right? Well, there, there now, I mean, there's so many different types of cannabis products now. I mean, uh, that were not around, that definitely were not around when I was in high school. Um, you know, all kinds of things, all sorts of edibles, chocolate bars, uh, cannabis-infused granola bars, candies, cookies, brownies, uh, fruit drinks, root beer. Um, it was shown uh, honey and sugar that, are, that have cannabis in them that I was told would be great with your morning coffee. Um, and even artificial sweeteners. If you're diabetic and you need an artificial sweet sweetener, there's cannabis-laced artificial sweeteners. All kinds of creams, all kinds of lotions. And then all, there's this whole other variety of uh, extract products, right, where they which have very high concentrations of, of THC. THC is the active component in, in cannabis that gives you your high. Um, and so really, you know, you have a much higher, much greater availability of different kinds of cannabis products than there used to be, and much, much stronger cannabis products than there used to be. The Drug Enforcement Agency in the mid-90s, when it, it would test the, uh, the marijuana that they seized, they found that the THC level was around, in the mid-90s, around 4%. 2014, it was around 12%. A lot of these dispensaries sell cannabis um, that's 20% or higher THC. So it's a much, tends to be a much stronger drug um, than it was uh, from a f just, you know, just a few years ago, and there are many more products available. That was something that was sort of eye-opening to me, because a lot of times I think in this debate, the conception of it just being sort of the, you know, the Cheech and Chong, Woodstock kind of drug, um, you know, it, it's a lot different. I mean, it's, it's the same drug, but it's a lot stronger, and it's in many different forms, so I think that's, that was an important thing. Um, the, another interesting group of people I talked to out there besides the bud tenders and hanging out at the dispensary. Uh, it, incidentally, at the, at the dispensary is really interesting too, just to see you know, what years ago would be described as drug deals going down are now fully legalized people walking in saying, you know, um, I want to get high, um, but I, it's the middle of the day and I don't want to get too sleepy, what would be good for me? And you know they get the recommendations, they put out the, the, the money. They have a, a loyalty card. You know they've got all kinds of reward programs, just like your grocery store would have. I mean, it's really um, I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm sounding naive here, but it was really quite remarkable. I, th I thought it was remarkable. Um, the, another interesting uh, group of people I talked to out there in Pueblo were doctors, um, and. I talked to an uh, ER doctor named Brad Roberts, um, who worked in the emergency room at Parkview Medical Center, which is Pueblo's uh, main, uh, main hospital. And one of the things he and some of his colleagues had seen would, were just sort of increases in the emergency room related uh, to cannabis consumption. I just want to, he described to me from last year three different uh, patients that he saw in, in the ER in a 24 hour period. And I just want to read, read a little passage here from the article, and I, I acknowledge that I'm reading my own article, but I, I apologize for that, but I, I couldn't put it any, any better than if I were just to describe it to you. So this is Brad Roberts. He said, the first patient, a woman in her 30s, came in on a stretcher wearing only a bathrobe. Medics had picked her up at the Loaf and Jug, a nearby convenience store, with blood on her face and head. She'd severed three of her toes on her left foot, had a gash on her hand. She'd been to the Parkview ER before, when police had found her throwing furniture off an overpass, and she tested positive then only for cannabis. On this visit, she tested positive for cannabis and meth. She wouldn't reply to Robert's questions and just kept repeating the Lord's Prayer. That's the first one. And the second patient was a teenager brought in by police. He had cut himself more than 100 times between his right elbow and his wrist and required 50 stitches. He stared blankly ahead, never acknowledging Roberts. His urine tested positive only for cannabis. And the third patient, a man in his late 40s or early 50s, came to the ER, said he had smoked pure cannabis oil. He told Roberts he had an out-of-body experience in which he knew the rapture had taken place. He had met the Antichrist, heard the trumpets of revelation, and believed it was his job to warn everybody. And so he says, uh, you know, 
I know. I, it's, you know, it's comical, but it's, it's kind of sad, too. And so um, Robert's recall, he said, I saw them back to back to back. I said, holy cow, these are horrible cuts, and you severed off your toes, and you aren't even responding to me. You're psychotic. And, you know, I, I think when you, when you look at cannabis, you look at marijuana as, as a drug, I mean, it, does, ha it is, does have a number of established, medically established benefits. I mean, it, it helps, you know, for example, glaucoma patients, um, you know, the swelling in the eyes, uh, stimulates appetites for people with, uh, with AIDS, helps, you know, control seizures, people with, you know, epilepsy, can help with nerve pain. I mean, there are a number of documented medical benefits, but there are also, and I think this gets lost sometimes, a number of documented um, negative uh, uh, associations with, with cannabis, and psychosis is one of them, especially given that now you're dealing with a, a tend, what tends to be stronger concentrations. Um, and there's also, um, you know, a, a newer thing that they've been seeing in the ER there in Pueblo, um, which where they get patients that come in and they're basically dry heaving, which is, I'm sorry, I know we've all just eaten lunch, but, it, you know, um, it's called scromedy, and they call it scromedy, which is a mixture of, um, uh, of uh, you're just sort of you're dry heaving. And so that's, um, that's one thing they see. It's not very well understood. Um, but like, you know, like a lot with marijuana, because there's not a lot of good research behind it, because it's still illegal federally, there haven't been a whole bunch of studies looking into some of these effects. Um, but they are starting to document some of these, um, some of these negative effects, which is why in Pueblo, the town that I studied, when it went for a vote a few years ago, there were 300 doctors in town that signed a letter saying this is a bad idea. So I, I think that, um, you know, I, I think we need to sort of, that, that needs to be reflected a little bit in, in some of the debate. They're also in Pueblo seeing, um, you know, an increase in the number of, uh, in the rate of expectant mothers who are testing positive for cannabis. Uh, a couple years ago, it was 4% of expectant mothers, up from 0.46% in 2012. They're seeing an increase in the percentage of newborns that are born with, um, th that test positive for cannabis, 6% uh, last year, up from 0.64% in 2012. So they are seeing those increases. You can say maybe there are other reasons, maybe those would have gone up anyway, but you know, if you look at that time period before it was legalized and now, I mean, you are seeing some medical, um, negative medical effects there. Um, so, you know, the takeaway that I got from that is, that, look, this is still a drug. I mean, if this were something that w had been produced by tobacco companies or pharmaceutical companies that had these sort of negative effects, um, you know, I think you'd be hearing a lot more about that. Um, uh, you know, Dr. Roberts, the ER doctor, told me, he says, it's sort of like we're building a plane while flying it in terms of the things that they're starting to learn about the effects of marijuana. Um, but the public policy seems to be getting maybe a little bit ahead of some of the health concerns. Um, I also spoke with a mother uh, out there, several mothers, but the most in, one of the most interesting, uh, Aubrey Adams, who's 44 years old, who was worried about the effect on her neighborhood. She would see, um, you know, drug deals going on in the streets. Um, you know, she worried about marijuana smoke and saw, you know, in many cases, people smoking marijuana, um, you know, the, the smoke drifting into her yard. Um, you know, and she, there was a shooting around the corner from her house when a drug deal, so a drug deal gone bad in the street. There, you know, a lot of times you hear, well, this we're we have this we're getting we're bringing marijuana out of the shadows, we're bringing it into the light, and we're taxing it, and we're making money off of it, which is which is true. But it hasn't eliminated the black market um, out there entirely because it's still a lot cheaper to grow marijuana in your house and sell it than it is to actually buy it from a uh, if you were to buy it from a dispensary where it's you know, taxed each step along the way and, um, and, and heavily regulated. So there, there are still, um, you know, there are still some issues, uh, issues with that. Um, Aubrey Adams was also worried, you know, about her son who in eighth grade um, started getting into marijuana, uh, started um, taking the, the, using the, the dabs, you know, which is the, the, the concentrate. He said, she said he would become irrational, paranoid, angry, tried to kill himself and overdosing on ibuprofen. Um, and he would run away from home. You know, it was, and, you know, this is something, and 
you know, teenagers, there have always been teenagers that have struggled with drug abuse. And so I said, well, what's different about this? And she told me, she said, well, he wouldn't have had access to this high potency crack weed, that's what she calls the dabs, wouldn't have had access to the high potency crack weed that we've just completely made accessible all throughout the community. He wouldn't have been exposed to all this normalization, glorification, commercialization. I know people don't give a crap about my kid, it's all my fault, they say, and I'm like, you have no idea how our children are being preyed upon and how impressionable they are. And, I mean, you know, my point is, you know, the, when I went into reporting this article, I was thinking, well, Colorado's been at it longer than anybody else, and people will have, um, you know, adapted to it. But there are still a number of people out there who are saying that they are seeing negative effects associated with legalizing marijuana. And so I think it's rational as any part of any public policy to try to understand those views and to try to, um, you know, incorporate them into whatever policies uh, come out and to not just pretend that, that people like that don't exist. Um, in, the, in the Pueblo schools, they got rid of uh, drug education several years ago in order to be able to put police on the streets. Um, they have found that the drug use is up slightly in Colorado. Um, the, the polls show that, uh, polls of student resource officers in Colorado said that 86% of student resource officers in Colorado believe that they're seeing more marijuana-related incidents in the schools, as well as 68% of school counselors think they're seeing more marijuana-related incidents in the schools. So it's a big public policy question, I think, for some of you in this room. You know, how do you keep, you know, if, if, if we agree as a society that we want to legalize marijuana, how do you keep it from impacting the kids? Because everybody kind of agrees we don't want the kids getting into it. Um, one of the other places I went was a, a big grow operation cultivation facility called Los Sueños Farms. I met, um, met a guy there named Jared Mason, who's 27 years old, whose brother uh, was a, a heroin addict who got into, he got into it really, um, he's a, the, one of the, the business manager there for this um, uh, cultivation uh, operation in Pueblo. Pueblo is a little bit different from a lot of places in that it allows outdoor marijuana production. Most of the marijuana production you see is inside warehouses. But in Pueblo, there are about 200 or so uh, outdoor farms, essentially, you know, forklifts, fertilizer. I mean, it's, it's a very advanced operation. Um, they've got there, they've, they're licensed for 36,000 plants on 40 acres of land. And they just hired a uh, microbiologist to help increase plant yields. Um, so, you know, it's a really serious farming, uh, farming operation. They're figuring out how to control pests, how to get rid of, um, you know, these uh, all kinds of different animals that would wander in and want to munch on the, on the leaves, um, increase the yield, increase the concentration. Um, you know, they've got about 50 employees at Los Sueños Farms. Um, you know, some people in Pueblo are, are envisioning trying to make Pueblo the, the, uh, the Napa Valley of pot. They want to make it, you know, the, this is sort of their salvation, not salvation, but, you know, their economic salvation maybe for a community where, you know, they can they can um, get a lot of investment uh, down there in the marijuana industry and, and make money off of that. And there's no doubt that, they're, that it is bringing in money for the community. Um, but, you know, the other thing that they complain about, and we were talking about this a little bit at lunch, that some of the businesses don't like, is that there, there are so many regulations that they have to comply with in terms of surveillance, in terms of tracking each plant throughout the process. Uh, paperwork requirements, and then to say nothing of how things work uh, or really don't work, you know, in dealing with uh, federal government rules, because it's still under federal law, it's something that's illegal. And the federal government has said in places where it's legal, we're not going, we are choosing not to uh, prosecute that. But there's, there are still a lot of uncertainties that come up, a lot related to banking. How do they, um, you know, if you're a business and you can't really, and Banks don't want to take money that they perceive as drug money for fear of getting cracked down on by the, the federal government. You know, how do you how do you deal with that? And they have they've developed workarounds, um, no doubt. I mean, there are state chartered banks, there are credit unions um, that, that deal with that. But it's definitely a hassle for these businesses that, from their point of view, the, these are legal these are legal businesses. So why are we having to go through a bunch of hassles that um, other businesses and other industries don't have to deal with? I also talked with uh, police. Um, you know, one of the big questions, uh, you know, is 
can you, is it possible, to, is, and what is the connection between crime and marijuana legalization? It's a very difficult question, and trying to establish causation is something that's a very difficult question. I mean, in, in Pueblo and in Colorado, crime is up a little bit, um, but, you know, it's, it's hard to say, well, what do we attribute that to? Um, you know, definitely their police say they are seeing more property crimes, um, you know, in which people are stealing things to sell them, to buy drugs, they're, they're seeing some of that. But again, it's, it's hard to draw some of those definitive links. They're seeing issues with code enforcement where, um, you know, they have, um, you know, they, they call them, uh, they refer to them as Cuban gangs that would come in, buy up a house because they know Pueblo is a good place to grow marijuana, clear out the house, put in a bunch of grow lamps, and grow, you're only allowed to grow 12 plants uh, in Colorado, but they would grow, you know, hundreds of plants indoors, they have, um, houses with electricity bills of $4,800 a month, which is, you know, uh, a lot more than you would normally spend, but because they have a lot of electricity and a lot of these grow lamps. Um, so, you know, and, and one of the police sergeants told me, you know, before legalization, we didn't have Cubans coming to Pueblo to grow marijuana. So, I mean, they, they definitely have, um, I mean, there are elements of that too that, that definitely have impacts um, uh, on the on the community, I think that needs to be considered. Uh, another another part, you know, um, th that they're seeing in Colorado, and like a lot of cities in uh, in the Western U.S., they're seeing an increase in the homeless population. They're seeing people moving from out of state, uh, settling in Pueblo, and um, uh, maybe can't, but maybe can't find housing. Uh, they have uh, you know sort of shanty towns along by the river. Um, the homeless organization there in Pueblo told me that they saw in 2016 three times the number of people uh, in 2016 than they did the previous year. A lot of that, they say, is from people moving to Colorado who want to be able to smoke weed legally. Um, it's, a big, it's sort of a controversial issue out there in terms of is this really, are they really coming here because of the marijuana or are they coming here for other reasons? The climate's nice. Uh, they expanded Medicaid, um, and certainly it's, you know, kind of like with crime, it's, it's a complicated causation uh, effect, but the people who work with the homeless and the police say there are definitely people who, move, who are moving there who are just basically coming there um, who want to smoke, but then who don't have the money to support themselves and wind up being, um, being a cost to the, to the community. Um, let's see. So yeah, a number, number of reasons, but again, it's, but you're seeing a lot of that. You're seeing a lot of, you know, homeless encampments in, um, in Los Angeles, Seattle, San Francisco, Denver. I mean, a lot of, that's something a lot of communities are struggling with. So that's just a little bit about um, some of the people uh, that I met and some of the things that I learned out there in, in Colorado. Again, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm coming to you as a, as a journalist. I'm not an expert in marijuana legalization regulations, um, I'm sort of telling you what I, what I learned and what I saw. I think, um, I think the challenge in, in trying to regulate this industry is that it's a new issue. And how do you incorporate the views of everybody who's affected by this? Um, I mean, it seems to me from the people I talk to out there that nobody feels as though the current regulations are working very well. Uh, a lot of the opponents don't like they don't like the fact that it was legalized to begin with, but they think that it's too accessible to kids. They think that it doesn't protect public health. They worry about crime. Um, and then the people that are in the industry, there's a lot of uncertainty about you know, the, the future. You know, businesses hate uncertainty, um, but you know, what's gonna happen at the federal level, what's happening at the state level, the regulations are changing all the time as states and localities are trying to keep up with this, uh, you know, with, with this issue. Um, but yeah, I mean, the state versus the federal government issue, I mean, that's, that's a big issue. Um, you know, how does that get resolved? Um, you know, I, I don't know the, I don't know how that gets resolved, but there's definitely those businesses feel as though the current system isn't working. I think there's legitimate, there are legitimate questions about public health. Um, you know, and, and do we have a situation where public opinion has maybe gotten a little bit ahead of public health? If, if you have a bunch of, if you have a drug that has medical downsides, um, but it's something that the public wants and that the public wants legalized, how do you reconcile those? What do you do? Um, you know, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. It's, um, I think that's a tricky issue if you're trying to protect public health, but you're trying to give the public what it has demonstrated that it wants. And then also, I think another interesting point is, um, 
is this industry that's that's being set up. If um, and when you were talking about regulations and and writing up regulations, and I was talking to Charlie, who was saying you know saying what some of the municipalities are doing around here. I mean, you have a bunch. You have this industry now in Colorado and probably uh, in other states that have legalized uh, of lawyers that all they do is cannabis related law of consultants cannabis consultants of bankers um, accountants I mean that you have this whole industry that is being set up to serve this newly legal industry as you would expect um, and there's a lot of money behind that and so uh, from a policy making point of view what happens you know when they start contributing to political candidates and what kind of influence are they having on the process and I think that's an important question, and it's something that should that should really be looked at in the lobbying, you know, lobbying political donations. And so, our policymakers, you know, to to what extent should that industry have influence on on public policy that you know that reflects um, public safety, public health, those sorts of things. And then you also have um, a, a whole media uh, industry that's set up in Colorado. There's any, I mean, there are dozens of. Um, cannabis industry publications that again make their money advertisements from uh, dispensaries from grow operations and all of the assorted industry and so is is the message and uh, is the news that's coming out from people that that cover the cannabis industry exclusively is that truly unbiased is it truly um, fair is it to reflect the, everybody or does it reflect the the interests of of this of this new industry so I think those are um, those are uh, important questions. Um, that's all I have, but I'm, I'm happy to take questions. Thanks so much for your talk. Um, we'll take some questions now. As always, students have priority. Hi, thank you so much for uh, coming here and speaking about this topic uh, with us. My name is Sasha, and I'm a senior here at CMC. And I wanted to ask about you know the changing sentiment towards marijuana from the population. You know, it, I I, th I don't know the numbers from two decades ago, but I know now it's maybe above 60 percent of the total population. You know, or adult population sort of supports some form of legalization. And I was wondering, in your own words, what do you think uh, is attributing this sort of uh, changing sentiment and what implications does it have for public policy on federal, state, or even local level? Yeah, thanks. No, that, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, the latest number I saw, I saw a Gallup poll, I think, from a year or so ago that said 64% of American adults support marijuana legalization. And that, that's nationwide. I mean, in, I would imagine in, in states like California, it's, it's you know, probably, probably even higher. In states like North Carolina, where I live, it's probably uh, probably lower, but I mean, that's, I mean, it's a remarkable transformation. Um, you know, to what do we attribute the the increase? Um, well, I mean, I think a lot of it, I think, um, you know, I think a lot of it comes from this idea of decriminalization. Do we really want to be throwing people in jail for years and years for um, for, for selling small amounts of uh, of marijuana or, or other drugs? I think um, I think that message has gotten through. I think the message of marijuana legalization advocates has gotten through. I think there's, in the public conception, I think there's kind of a, a shrug, you know, um, what's, what's the big deal? Um, you know, you, you want to go with, use marijuana in your house, why should the government, why should the government prevent you from doing that? I mean, I think that's not an unreasonable, um, you know, position. Um, but I think, it, you know, for policymakers, I think they sort of need to look, um, you know, look at the bigger picture and look at some of the potential effects. Hi, thank you very much for your talk. I was just wondering uh, if you could speak a little bit about regulation because uh, in your talk you spoke about how there is a lot of regulation. It sometimes causes problems and some people don't follow it. So moving forward in places that plan to legalize marijuana, uh, do you think that there should be more or less regulation? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't, I don't know if it's really more or less regulation, but how do you have effective regulation. I mean, it's sort of, you know, the struggle for policymakers is it, it's an entirely new industry. And so regulations that you put out, you know, there's not a lot of history behind it. So you know, you know, what's effective, what's not effective. Um, 
So I, I think it's, it's really a question of how do you have effective regulations if we agree as a society that this is something that we want, how do we do that in a way that minimizes the negative effects? Negative effects being, you know, effects on, um, on the community. Um, you know, a lot of people probably you know, support the idea of, being, of there being dispensaries, of being able to walk in somewhere and legally buy marijuana. That doesn't necessarily mean they want to live next to a dispensary or live next to, um, you know, a, a grow operation or have their kids you know, in a school that is right next to a dispensary. So it's, a, and, and they're, they've have put in laws, you know, on that, you know, restricting the locations. Um, but so it's a question of how do you, how, do, how are you effective in coming up with those regulations? And it's sort of, I mean, the great thing about our system in, uh, with federalism is you have different states trying different things. And yes, some states are gonna be guinea pigs and they're gonna be real negative effects and things that they learn. It would be my hope that states that are newly legalizing can look to some of the previous examples and see what has worked, what hasn't worked, um, you know, in, in formulating those regulations. Hello, my name is Bruno. I'm a senior here at CMC. Thank you so much for coming to talk. My question is also about regulation, specifically a lot of people on the pro-legalization side advocate a regulatory regime similar to that of alcohol, but I'm interested in ways in which maybe there can't be a one-to-one -one comparison, or there aren't one-to-one -one similarities between how th those two should be regulated. Yeah, no, that's a good question. I mean, the, the parallel to alcohol um, is very often raised. I mean, that said, alcohol does also cause a lot of problems. When you look at, you know, DUI deaths, you look at, um, you know, alcoholism, not to say that we should go back to an era of prohibition, um, but, you know, I don't know how you, I mean, how do you make that re regulatory regime of alcohol more effective when we've been at that since, what, the 1930s and you still have, you still have a lot of negative effects and we've said as a society, essentially, we're, we're willing to tolerate those for the, the greater good of, uh, of us, um, you know, having a Bloody Mary uh, before the football game or whatever. I mean, it, which, is, which is fine, that's, a, that's, you know, that's, that's what a society does and it, ma it makes those choices. Um, you know, but I, I think it's about trade-offs. The other thing, the other argument you hear a lot with marijuana and alcohol is that marijuana, it, rather than um, being something totally new, is it, how much is it taking from alcohol? So some of these negative effects, so if you say, okay, well, there are twice as many um, uh, car crashes related to cannabis in Colorado than there were five years ago, then you probably also have to look at, well, is that replacing the number of alcohol car crashes, you know, the, the drunk driving car crashes, or is it in addition to it? And, you know, really one of the things, one of the things that I found is that there hasn't really been a lot of study about this. It's still relatively new. There are not a lot of organizations doing the work of, of studying the, some of these effects. Colorado did a particularly poor job, their governor says this, of, um, of trying to document statistics from before legalization. So they have a bunch of data now, but they can't really, they have nothing, very little to compare it with from five years ago. So, you know, given that lack of data from five years ago, it's kind of hard to know what some of those effects are. Um, you know, I think, you know, the effects of alcohol are fairly clear and well known. Um, the effects of cannabis, I think, are, you know, it's still sort of in its infancy and we just, there's just a lot we don't know. Hi, my name's Jamie, I'm a freshman. Um, thank you for coming and talking uh, to us today. You mentioned um, the difference in incarceration rates by race. I was wondering whether you found that the difference decreased after legalization in Colorado. Yeah, uh, that's actually not something I looked at. The person who introduced me, I think, was mentioning incarceration rates by race. Um, so I don't, I don't have any information on incarceration rates by race as it relates to marijuana. Hi, I'm Danielle, I'm a senior at CMC. Um, so you had mentioned in the beginning that Pueblo had hoped that bringing the marijuana growing slash selling industry would like revitalize their town. Did that seem to be, I mean, I know that you said that it also brought in a lot of, you know, vagrants and possibly um, aesthetically maybe 
didn't make it look like it was economically thriving, but did the people who had lived in Pueblo before feel like the industry was improving their city? Yeah, that, that's a good question. I mean, it's hard to know empirically, short of public opinion polls. I mean, the people in Pueblo did vote for it repeatedly. Um, you know, I think by a two to one margin, that it's something that they wanted in their community. Um, the study by CSU Pueblo looked at the, tried to look at the economic effect uh, in Pueblo, and it found that there was a positive economic effect that um, it took in, I believe it was something like uh, $36 million. You know, there are all these studies anytime, you know, anybody wants to build a new sports stadium, or do, there are all these questions of economic impact. But they said that uh, overall it was a net positive, that there were some social costs, but that overall the amount of money that they took in um, was positive, and that's money that's being used to repair streets, um, you know, maybe some of it goes to the schools, some of it goes for other government projects. I mean, some of it went, I mean, they, they have a municipal golf course and they bought, you know, one of the things they bought was, were new golf carts. I mean, th there's all sorts of things that they put that, that tax revenue um, to use. Um, but as far as, you know, whether people in Pueblo are all of a sudden saying to themselves, oh my gosh, this was a huge mistake, we need to, we need to undo this, I don't think that that, uh, I didn't find that. Hi, um, my name's Robin. I'm a freshman at CMC, and I am from Colorado. Mm -hmm. uh, so All I right, you're the expert. We're <laughs> going to ask you the questions. <laughs> um, not actually. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, so I was wondering, Pueblo's not exactly um, super representative of the majority of Colorado. Uh, there are some urban and then uh, or there's some rural kind of like Pueblo and then much more urban areas like Boulder and uh, Fort Collins and Denver. Uh, how can you be certain that uh, Pueblo and like the grow farms and the culture there is like representative of all of Colorado and mm -hmm. hence can be representative of the younger population, mm -hmm. especially in like the United States? Yeah, no, I mean, that, that's a good question. Um, you know, and I'm not trying to claim that it's that Pueblo is representative of Colorado. You know, Pueblo is is an industrial town. It's an old steel town. Um, you know, two hours uh, south of Denver. You know, largely left out of Colorado's growth. It's you know, when you think of Denver, you think of you know hiking the Rocky Mountains. You think of skiing. Um, th that's not necessarily what you think of when you go to Pueblo. Um, and so it's not representative. And I, I acknowledge it's not representative. Um, it, as a journalist, you know, I'm trying to. I, what I was trying to do was was to tell a, an interesting story. So in journalism, sometimes you do look at some of the extremes. Pueblo might be an extreme in the sense that there aren't a lot of communities that are saying, "Bring it on!" You know, we're all in on on cultivation um, and outdoor grow operations. One of the few, if any, in the country that has outdoor uh, grow operations. So yes, is Pueblo representative of Colorado? No. It's not. Is it represented? Is it? Are there real concerns being expressed by people in Pueblo about the effect of marijuana legalization? Yes, and those those effects I think are present to a certain degree. I would be fairly certain in just about every community. But yes, it, it might be more pronounced in Pueblo. Um, you know, every community is different. It's hard to find. I mean, I don't know. If you were to try to pick the 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 typical. Um, Colorado community, I think that's kind of difficult because there's just so much diversity within Colorado. I mean, Denver, uh, I mean, Denver's a very interesting place, you know, big city, you know, the effect in a big city is gonna be much different probably than it is in a town of 100,000 people. Um, that's sort of one of the limitations of, of, um, of, of journalism like this. Sure. You might, um, yeah, so the, the first one on THC versus CBD. Um, yeah, I mean, the people that I talked with um, mostly it were the, the ER people, so they were describing what they were seeing in the ER. Um, I, I mean, I talked to other, you know, 
addiction specialists who, who had some concerns as well. I mean, there's, I mean, it's certainly an important distinction that some of the benefits from cannabis are from the CBD, and you're seeing some movements, I think, on that. I think the FDA recently approved, was it a CBD pill? Um, so to, to try to get some of the benefits that you see from cannabis, but not in a way that um, has THC and uh, impairs you or maybe has some other uh, effects that are, that are linked to um, I mean, some of these other negative uh, outcomes like psychosis or something. Um, so they're, they're definitely, I mean, the medical community I think is definitely aware of some of these differences, but they are also a little bit handicapped in the way that um, the federal government uh, limits research on this, uh, on this federally illegal drug so that they're not maybe able to do as much research as they would like, but um, you know, but there are some some movements I think toward that. To your second point on the um, you know the equivalent of a cannabis breathalyzer, um, yeah, that's my understanding as well. I mean, I think it's it's not as easy um, to detect uh, as alcohol. So yeah, I mean, you have to wonder about maybe some of the reliability of the data. It's sort of one of the themes that I keep coming back to in this is that you would think that. Four years into it, you would have really good data. Uh, the data is actually not not that good or not that definitive. Um, so, does that mean that there aren't problems? Um, no. Is it hard to document? Yes. Unfortunately, we have time for only one more question. Hi, my name is Emily. I'm a student writer for the Claremont newspaper. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for coming. This is super interesting. Um, and my question is addressing the concerns of people like Aubrey, mothers, um, and doctors with greater access to marijuana, uh, how, do we, how do you think we could prevent overuse by the youth whose brains are still developing? Hmm. Well, that's a tough question. I mean, I mean, a lot of people, I think, have struggled with that, with that question. I mean, it's a, it, it's a problem. I mean, if, if you say, you know, I think a lot of times people people sort of hear what they want to hear, and they hear, okay, marijuana is legal, okay, and they hear, and they know that marijuana is naturally grown, and so they think, well, that's maybe about as far as the thinking on, from, uh, I think, a lot of people goes. Um, so, it, you know, it's a question of if you legalize it, are you encouraging it, and it, are you creating a situation in which you're you're essentially saying to people, society has determined that this is something that is good, um, and I think that's I think that's a concern. I mean, as a parent, I think that's a that's a concern. If we say marijuana is legal, there's an assumption that, okay, well, society says it's legal, so it must not be harmful. When in fact, that's not necessarily the case. So, what do you do to prevent uh, youth from uh, using marijuana? I mean, that's you know, that's um, that's been a struggle for decades, you know? People, people have used marijuana for a long time and all will continue using marijuana. Um, so I don't know, I mean, is it more drug education in the schools? I don't know if that's effective. I think there have been studies that show that that's maybe of limited effectiveness. Um, uh, I don't have a good answer to that, but I don't think anybody else does either. Well, that's all the time we have. Please join me in thanking Mr. Mercia.